Hi, I'm Jeff Dial, and welcome to today's Footprints in American History. Today's edition is part one of, anyone seen my nuke? Goldsboro's Broken Arrow. For those of you who are younger, you may not remember the days of the Cold War when people feared a nuclear exchange between the Soviet Union and the United States. Schools had drills where children hid under their desks in case of a nuclear blast. Many public buildings such as schools and libraries were deemed fallout shelters and some homeowners even built and stocked bomb shelters in their backyards to protect themselves in case a nuclear exchange happened. Had the events of January 1961 became a worst case scenario, the resulting confusion could have led to finger pointing and resulted in such a war. This story is how the Cold War tensions could have resulted in one town in North Carolina's destruction and possibly sparked a war of unfathomable consequences. This is the story of Goldsboro's Broken Arrow. Hi. I'm Jeff Dial, and welcome to another edition of Footprints in American History, where we explore lesser-known United States history. Today's story is part one of a three-part series called, Anyone Seen My Nuke? Part one is Goldsboro's Broken Arrow. Before I tell you this amazing story, I wanted to speak to those of you who might be younger or less familiar with what times were like during the days of the Cold War. Many older viewers will probably remember the fear and worries that came from living in those times. One thing that I have discovered about studying history is that far too often we apply our understanding and values to a period where people's ethics and morals contradict our own. The result is we don't understand how somebody could choose a course of action or make a decision that seems smart. We wonder why someone or some people did what they did and do not understand why or how they were capable of such choices. For many of you, especially those of you in the younger generations, that will be especially true with times like the Cold War when one wrong move could have led to nuclear war and millions of people being killed. Let me explain. During World War II, the United States and Russia were allies especially against Germany, which was a major enemy of both. Once the war was over, however, there were now two major powers in the world, and neither side trusted each other. The United States especially feared communism, and it spread to other countries. The Soviet Union, as it had become known, was a serious threat dominating countries in its region and possessing nuclear and atomic technology, just like the United States. The fear of the time was that the Soviets were a first-strike nation, meaning that they would likely strike the United States first with nuclear weapons, crippling our defenses, and leveling our cities. It was decided that at all times, 12 bombers would be airborne with nuclear weapons aboard should this happen. While the United States would not strike first, the plan was that of deterrence. Once attacked... Our bombers would cross over and strike pre-selected targets with our bombs in retaliation. The plan came known as Operation Chrome Dome. The reason I explain this is that many of you will probably wonder, as I have, how is it possible that a plane could crash and have an incident with a nuclear bomb aboard? Why would there not be another form of ordnance aboard that would do far less destruction? And this is the reason why, to keep the threat of retaliation real to an enemy we did not trust across the Arctic Circle. If they knew we had the ability to strike back quickly with the same force they used on us, the chances are much lower that they would consider an attack. And that meant keeping bombers with nuclear weapons in the air at all times. 12 bombers in different locations, ready to fly across the Arctic Circle at a moment's notice. A notice that fortunately never came. And now, how Goldsboro's Broken Arrow came to happen. It was 1961. Only a few days before, John F. Kennedy had been elected President of the United States. Around midnight on January 24th, a B-52 Stratofortress was flying over South Carolina. They were about to conduct an air-to-air -air refueling with another plane when the crew noticed the bomber leaking fuel from the right wing. 
They told Major Walter Tullock, the pilot, about the leak, who in turn contacted ground control about the issue. He was told to fly out to sea and circle to burn off excess fuel to prevent disaster when they landed at their home base, Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina. Shortly afterward, things began to unravel. Major Tullock radioed ground control that he had lost 37,000 pounds of fuel in only three minutes. At this point, ground control ordered them to return to base. It was too little, too late. At 10,000 feet, a weight imbalance became too strong for the plane structure to sustain, and the wings began to break apart. The crew couldn't control the plane anymore, and Major Tullock ordered the crew to bail out. At 9,000 feet, they did. The pilot and co-pilot, Captain Richard Rarden, ejected through a hatch. A few other crew members were also able to escape as things got worse. Lieutenant Adam Maddox, the third pilot, undid his harness only to have G-forces toss him 10 feet from his seat. He struggled to reach one of the hatches the other pilots ejected from jumping. Fortunately, he did not get hit by any part of the plane and he found himself in freefall in the dark night. He deployed his parachute and looked to the B-52, now falling faster. About one to 2,000 feet, the plane broke up and the bombs came out. To this day, Lieutenant Adam Maddox is the only known person to jump from a strata fortress without an ejection seat. It was reported that the crash of the bomber turned the North Carolina sky bright as day. Some witnesses said the event looked like a Roman candle. The debris of the plane were scattered and the bodies of crew members were found in the wreckage. The first people to respond were from the Faro Volunteer Fire Department. Within an hour, many helicopters circled the area and Air Force personnel came to the scene telling the locals to evacuate. Afterward, the body of Major Gene Shelton, the radar operator and navigator, was found dead with a broken neck hanging by his parachute in a tree. Sergeant Frank Barnish, the gunner, and Major Eugene Richards, the explosive weapons ordnance instructor, were found dead in the wreckage. Major Tullock, the pilot, was thought dead, but he had landed in a swamp and made his way to the base. Lieutenant Maddox landed next to a farmhouse. He went to the family there and told them what happened. The family gave him a ride to the base. Oddly enough, when Maddox reached the gate, he discovered his pockets had been torn off escaping the crash. He had no identification and the air police assumed he was a straggler trying to get on base. 20 minutes passed. Major Tullock also reached the gate with no pockets. At this point, the situation was straightened out and both pilots were taken by ambulance to the hospital with air police behind them. The debris field covered two square miles of rural countryside, mostly tobacco and cotton fields, roughly 12 miles from Goldsboro. The next day, the Air Force found both bombs. One bomb's parachute never deployed. The weapon fell free fall, striking muddy farmland at over 700 miles per hour. The speed and force of the bomb forced the body of the nuke 180 feet beneath rain-soaked ground. The tail assembly broke free in this process, wedging it 20 feet down along with the core. The second bomb's parachute did deploy, and it was found hanging from a tree a short distance from the other. At this point, an explosive ordnance disposal team was dispatched from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, led by Lieutenant Jack Ravel, a 25-year-old officer who had no clue what he was about to learn. The two bombs aboard the B-52 were three four megaton Mark 39 weapons. Each bomb was up to 260 times more powerful than the one that fell on Hiroshima. At the site of the first bomb, Lieutenant Ravel and his men excavated the site down to 20 feet where the tail assembly had lodged. A sergeant with the team approached the lieutenant. He told Ravel that he had found the arming switch to the bomb. Great was his reply. Not great, came the reply. It was unarmed. These words shook Ravel to the heart. Later, Ravel himself, without any protective gear beyond gloves, climbed into the hole and felt around the muddy water. He pulled out a heavy metal object the size of a cantaloupe. It was the plutonium pit. Terrified, he slowly moved it to safety. 
From there, the excavation was abandoned. Overwhelming groundwater prevented the team from digging any further, and most of the uranium and plutonium were still in the body of the bomb far below. However, with the recovery of the plutonium pit and 92 explosive detonators, the rest of the bomb became mostly inert. There had been speculation that the military had poured concrete from the site down, but this actually is not true. The body of the bomb remains 180 feet below ground in a part of the field few people are aware of. Later on, the Army Corps of Engineers bought a 400-foot diameter plot of land around the landing site, and every year the University of North Carolina monitors the groundwater there. A single malfunction of the arming switch prevented a major catastrophe. The second bomb was found intact, hanging by its parachute in a tree. Again, Lieutenant Ravel was in for the surprise of his life. All of the bomb's ignition sequences had activated, but the manual arm switch was unsafe when it hit the ground. Again, more fail-safe measures had failed. A low-technology safety switch on the second bomb was the only thing that prevented a serious disaster. It was commented that had one or both bombs gone off, there would have been a Bay of North Carolina created where Goldsboro and an Air Force base were located. It was not long after that that the military abandoned that model bomb aboard strategic bombers. The U.S. government shortly afterward informed the Soviet government of the incident, warning them to make similar adjustments to their nuclear weapons to prevent another episode. For the American people, however, it would not be until the 21st century that we would learn how close to disaster we came. Had the bombs exploded, the radiation cloud would have been deadly. It would have covered major population centers such as Norfolk, Washington, and New York. It could have spread as far south as Savannah as well. Only in 2013, when a writer named Eric Schlosser put in a Freedom of Information Act request for a book he was writing, did people learn how close to disaster this incident was. In the 1960s, when the incident was being investigated, the Pentagon stated that no arming mechanisms had been activated in the Goldsboro Broken Arrow. It was later discovered to be a lie. This incident could have had far worse ramifications besides the loss of life in North Carolina and radioactive fallout. In 1961, the Cold War was fully underway. Tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union were high, and the fears of a nuclear war were real. Many older adults can recall seeing the fallout shelter signs in public libraries and school buildings. I can still vividly remember seeing these signs in elementary and junior high school, where I had spent many years in Hampton, Virginia. What is truly frightening about the story is that between 1950 and 1968, there were at least 700 incidents involving nuclear weapons aboard aircraft around the world, and this is what we do know. According to an interview with Eric Schlosser, who wrote a book called Command and Control, a serious concern is that despite American safety measures and fail-safes, such incidents still happen. And this even though the U.S. tries to be safe with nuclear weapons. The concerns, in his opinion, are countries like North Korea, India, and Pakistan, which also have nuclear weapons but less control over their nukes and safety measures. Thank you for watching today's edition of Footprints in American History. You don't want to miss next week's episode where we discuss an air accident involving two military jets colliding near the coast of Georgia and how one had to ditch a nuclear weapon in case of a crash. We will discuss what could have happened if there had been a detonation and the Navy's frantic efforts to locate and recover this dangerous weapon. I'm Jeff Dial and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed the story, please like and share the video, hit the subscribe button for more con content, and ring the bell to get notifications whenever we post. Until next time, fair winds and following seas.